much, and uh, thank you for being here, taking the time away from your family and your jobs in hopes to learn something from me, maybe. But I did bring my crayons in case I got to teach this presentation to Randy Stewart afterwards, the Brussels crayon, so if he understands it, make sure he's like, we're lucky to have Randy in this organization. Um, you talk about enthusiasm, every year behind the scenes, he really is the, the cog that makes this thing spin. So again, we're lucky to have the Stewart family. So um, without further ado, um, if you want to find this, this video or what I'm doing here, because sometimes I talk a little fast, um, go to KD Tennis. It's going to be tough to find me in the hall room because I'm so big. I'm right up there next to the Kardashians. So KD Tennis, and hopefully this video will work out and you'll be able to see some of the things. And maybe you can come up and say, I disagree with you on this component of biomechanics, and I can learn from you. So um, this isn't something that I invented. I stole most of this as many of us have. So without further ado. It's going. <laughs> and again, thank you for Juice for, for coming out. This is third year, so if you look at my other videos, you'll see he's about this big, now he's, now he's up. So again, thank you very much. Um, I believe Jane go van for this weather. Okay, he moved on to greener pastures, but he's still a tennis person at heart. Um, this drill that we're gonna do today, one of the drills, um, I knew I was gonna be inside. This lesson really covers the whole gamut of what you have. The lesson later, kid. I'm not gonna work for you today because I got a clinic later. I have a private lesson later. Okay, the kid that might be too good, okay, too good for your team, it's gonna push him or her, okay? And that's where the, the term jump boy comes from, all right? All show, no go. The kid that can slap alert, crush the ball, but can't get a lot of balls in the court and all of a sudden after the first round of the opens and major zones, he loses, he or she loses. Or your player that's not good enough. Um, a lot of times this will really work for a kid that might not be on the level of the rest of your team. Because let's face it, like who do you get? Who do you get when you come out? <coughs> All right. So again, you know, use of time. Use of time is important because the, the kids that you get, that we'll talk about here in a second, the kids that you get, we're not on block schedule in our district. I don't know how you all are. But with our district, we have about 45 minutes, maybe an hour and a half, and with the weather in the spring cycle on days like this, it's tough to get that training volume in. Next year, I'll upgrade your videos, all right? Okay, so biomechanics that work, maybe. So again, these are things, and I've done some studying. I'm gonna quote some of my sources and sites. Stop that right there. Um, so basically, the, the biomechanics that I've had uh, that are successful, and, and usually give these biomechanical um, triggers and these markers one at a time. It's tough to do two, three, four things with kids. And with the plethora of information that's out right now, you've got coaches eye, you've got huddle. Sometimes too much information is a bad thing for these kids. So you have to take good pieces of information and utilize your time. The, the kids that you have, going back to that, you have your outliers. You have your kids that are great athletes. Okay, but then you have your middle of the bell shaped curves. Or you've got a kid that's a friend of a tennis player. And you've got to make them curious about tennis. Okay, making them curious is also making them successful. Okay, you can't develop something unless you change it. You can't change something unless they improve. Okay, so all these are my observations while working to win the last point. Okay, all these are my observations, and, and again, competition is great, but not every kid that's going to pick up your, a racket in your program is going to want to play tournaments. Not every kid that picks up a racket in your program is going to want to go on and, and play college tennis. So you have to not be smart with, with not only what you teach them, but how you teach them. Okay, and success is, is, is very fleeting. Okay, just ask David um, Miller. You know, poor guy, right? He has how many state titles, but now he's, he's having to do a lot more. And he's a great coach, and I'm, I'm sure he's going to pull through that. Um, one thing that anybody know who Teddy Atlas was? He trained Mike Tyson. You know, he said, well, what's Mike Tyson's record? Someone said, oh, it's like 56, 55 and 6. No, he was 0 and 5. Because every time he faced a challenge, he let himself down. Okay, for whatever reason. So that brings me back to thinking, well, you know, Teddy's kind of smart about that when he fought Holofield and he fought different boxers. You know, that's like putting in a race a Lamborghini versus a Prius. That's not really a win. That's not really a success. You know what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. But getting the depth of your team and using, utilizing this drill um, really has, has served me pretty well. Okay? You say, well... If you're working one-on-one -on -one with kids, what do you do with the other kids? I created a battle board. And you can't really see it. All it is is a cork board, and it's got Velcro. 
and players are allowed to challenge each other two spots up, or Coach Sanchez and I, this is my assistant by the way, Coach Sanchez and I have sent kids out, even if they're at the bottom to the top, they have to accept that challenge. So I have boys and girls, so I have a second one, and sorry about the, the contrast here. And, and I put little pictures up, things that I want to see, like we'll have a theme of the day, a lot of times it, it's a picture of Billie Jean King, so it shows that some of these principles aren't, it's not the modern game. These things have been going on for a while, these joint angles, and they finally study them. Okay, so on the top of the left side, I've got a picture of Billie Jean King with that racket up on head, while the hand is up above the head. Because a lot of times you're going to film these players, we use coach's eye, and you're going to see the racket head. Can I use your racket right here? I like this one. You're going to see them come off the contact with an open face sandwich. You're going to see this. You're not going to see this. So a lot of times you make grip changes, you got to make swing changes, and we're going to go over that a little bit today. All right? Next one. You see what happened? I've had a little bit of help. I've had luck. I've worked at Voluntary Saddlebrook Macy's. I've worked at different academies all up and down the East Coast. And again, I was lucky enough to work at Macy's with Brian Gordon, and for lunch, $300 a stroke. Um, he analyzed them and put from three different cameras, 20 different diodes, um, and if someone wanted help on their forehand, it was three bills, a lot of money. So hopefully some of these things will help you kind of shorten up what you do with your kids and get them to where they want to be. All right. <coughs> we talked about developing and improving. First and foremost, when we're talking about high level biomechanics, our responsibility is to make sure that we teach these kids how to move their body without getting hurt. When we're talking about these extreme joint forces, racket at speed, light racket, stiff rackets, polyester, blends, hard courts, okay? We don't want to get our kids hurt, okay? That's one thing that we don't want to do. All right, adapt versus optimize, and then we'll get to feeding. You can just stop there right here, thanks. Um, adapt versus optimize. In August, what are you doing? In August, hopefully you're optimizing the kids that you have, all right? But right now, this time of year, you have to adapt them. You have to make those changes. And a lot of coaches don't understand that, okay? Sometimes they have to be willing to break it to make it better. Just like working out, you break the muscle and it comes back stronger. Same thing with any kind of motor skill, but let's optimize in February and March. Let's optimize in August and September. Let's periodize, let's be smart. Let's not just do the same things. So you have to get out of your comfort zone. So from this drill that I do, I have to get out of my comfort zone. This is something that I didn't do very often. I stood 78 feet away from the kids. Okay? Let me go ahead and push it on. Come back here. Again, we'll get to my sources here. We'll talk about Google Scholar in a little bit. So what I'll start out with, if I've got beginners, you know, just out of the hand. He's not going to hit the ball, but just out of the hand. Just out of the hand. And then I'll progress to here. And I'll progress up there. So when he's making his swing, obviously, but that's where I start, all right? Then I check off some boxes. Then I check off some boxes. Don't move that ball behind your feet. A lot of these programs that I do, a lot of these, with this drill, you yeah, make sure it's done. So I'll, I'll do X patterns or I'll do triangles. X patterns or triangles. So I'll come over here, clear the ball up high, clear the ball up high, and then back in, low, 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 back in, chance that shot. Back in, up deep, back in, up deep, and then forehand, forehand, low, 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 get up to it. So you got a kid, that doesn't want to work in practice, they have to move. They have to move, okay? Another combo here, another combo here. I go, okay, clear it, clear it. All right, you go over slice, go slice, slice here. Move through your body, move through your body, move through your body. So again, all those different combos, all right? But guess what? Let's say he doesn't have a backhand volley. Guess what I do? Okay, same ways I'm giving it to you. Even better, even better. I'll demonstrate it here. I'll say, okay, same amount of rotation, same ball, same trajectory, same ball, okay? Or even better, even if they're weaker than that, copy me, copy me, copy me. That's what I say all the time. Another one, don't rotate. You should see how the kids try to scoop themselves out of this drill when I'm doing this. Copy it, copy it, copy it. I'm not giving them a lot of information, I'm showing them, all right? A lot of our kids don't learn well hearing. They have to feel. I'm also in a power position. I can have somebody come over here, and then I'm doing it with them. I'm doing it with them. 
I might work on the path, which plane it's in, sagittal, transverse, horizontal. I might work on those things. And I don't explain it like that. I don't explain it like that. We're going to talk about hip drive on the surf. You know what I call it? Hip and whip. The dance sound, mm -hmm. right? That's an internal rotation of the shoulder. That's internal rotation. So if they can do that dance, they can hit a pretty good serve up here. All right? I don't explain. I don't give them the verbiage. Sometimes I do, just to amuse myself. But then again, you get some kids that, that actually like it. This is probably, thank you, appreciate it. This is probably one of the biggest things that pays off dividends trying to get them to that optimization. What's the weakest shot that your players have? Don't be shy. What's the weakest shot? What's the hardest shot? Most complicated stroke. I think they're all the same. Serve, right? Overhead motions. You get a lot of people coming in with the wrong grip. And again, you got to make swing changes. So what I do, all right, and I don't get hit. I stand off far enough to the side, okay, where if it's a little bit late, all right, I can still kind of get out of the way. My feet from the side, just kind of like where they go in baseball. Okay? It's kind of slow. So what I'll do is I'll start out here. I'll start out here. And I can work on things. I can talk about that. I can talk about the hip. I can talk about the hip. I can talk about lifting up that shoulder, getting it in the right spot. All right? I can get to them. I don't have to walk all the way around 20 feet and get to them. Then guess what I do? My next progression. Then you have to pop it down. So you've got to hit there. So you've got to hit there. All right? Get that hip up. Get that hip up. Come on. Get up. There you go. And see, when he does this, because he's doing it right, He's, he's here. His arm is over his head. All right? You're going to get kids with poor grips. All right? It's going to be here. And that's, that's not good. You're not going to get really much out of it. Then from there, once I get my kids to a pretty decent level, then I'll go here. And it changes his body. It says his lights. Be clear. Go back. And it's that same drill. And he goes back. So whichever skill that I'm working on, whichever skill that I'm doing, I can, I can, oh, he, he doesn't clear the ball up. Here, clear the ball, get it over my racket, get it over my racket. Come on, get it up off of the racket, come on. All right? So I can kind of tailor make the drill for them. Then I send them to pick up. Then I send them over on my hitting wall. I made the mistake, I bought, mistake, I bought a, a fiberglass hitting wall and I only put a 12, 14 foot piece of cement. It was probably one of the better mistakes that I made. I've never had a fiberglass backboard before. It's always been plywood. All right, it's not terribly a plywood, you know, different clubs. So the ball's carrying off so far. Guess what they can work on? Someone shouted it out, weakest shot at Zabali. And I kind of agree on that. All right, so does that make sense? Any questions before we move on? Yes? Well, the, the best, I think, from Bacco, am I right? Some of you, Bacco, I think, has the best Bacco, but again, it depends on your bid list, right? All right, we have a booster club, and now we can. We can kind of use what we want, but backo fiberglass backboards, and I took the money that I raised last year and, and put down a concrete slab. Okay, so um, snap raise is a really good one. I've mentioned them before. Um, snap raise is great. I think I earned about seven thousand dollars plus last year with with that. And, and again, if everybody does a little, the one thing good that they do is they keep sending out emails. So like it'll get real heavy at the front end, and then you'll get kind of a lull, and then kind of. You, They'll send out a reminder email every couple weeks, but that snap raise will help you raise money to get, you know, what you need. Go ahead and start that. Any other, any other, we'll, we'll, we'll answer some questions at the end unless they pertain to that drill. Unless they pertain to that drill. You know, a couple things for, for us nerds, I include that myself in that as tennis nerds. I use kind of an eastern grip. I don't use a continental. And I put the ball down right by my feet. So just kind of go back in that back corner. So like if I'm feeding backhands, I know he's probably going to hit pretty late if I pop it in there. So I sort of set myself up on the, the crossword angle. And so I use basically my you know, shake hands grip, my Easter grip, and then I go from there. From there, I'm going to down on my feet. And again, he's going to be much further back. But I can slow it down. You know what I mean? If that was deuce, he'd be further back, but that's about how fast I would be. So you know, I, can, I can take the feet. But the trick is on that feeding, again, Easter grip, and, and put it down by your feet. Put it down like only like I see the marks after I do this. Like I see the marks in there. They're you know, a few inches off to the right. Again, I stole this. I just kind of made it my own. And then again, the sharper the angle that the ball comes down, what's going to happen? It's going to go higher. 
All right. So if I have a much sharper angle here, then that, that ball's going to go up, and he's got to take a kick serve. I played Daniel Brown. Anybody remember that kid? He played at A&M a few years back. I played him in Bentwater Country Club in doubles when I could still play and feel my elbow. All right. And I was in the side fence on the ad side up above my shoulder. So you're saying, well, you know, if I've got a decent kid at number one and he's got to play a Daniel Brown like kid, you better be sure that he can hit that kind of shot. All right. Second thing. Even a ball with slice after the bounce, what kind of rotation does it have? Even slice, if I, if I roll this ball to you with, with, with slice, it's going to roll back in the other direction. So if this drill, where I'm, where I'm here, the ball's going to have topspin. If somebody hits a topspin lob, they're not going to freak out and panic. They're going to see that topspin coming, and they're not going to bail. Okay? They're not going to bail. So this is kind of my junk volume destroyer. And, and some people call it, what do they call it? The drill. Oh, this is the drill. Or if someone does it in a match, oh, that was the drill, that was the drill. This is the shot they got most, this is the drill. All right, this is the shot here. Overhead on the back on the side. Overhead on the back on the side. Back on the side. Go back in. Oh, back, yeah, overhead on the back on the side. Well, that's a kick place on this top. And how about, how about over the head? How about slight? Right there. That's the shot that a lot of people weren't really comfortable with. But then what I can do after that, right? Coach will tell you, that's the drill, that's the drill. It might happen two or three times a set, but that could be the difference between 5-7 and 7-5. All right? So then I'll combine it with this. So then I'll do like a backhand overhead, and then I'll do a volley. And then I'll make him go over and get a slice. And then I'll make him come over there and do a slice on that side. All right? So that's, that's basically what I do. You can do it with, you know, quick start balls in a gym. Um, you can do it on a wet day, but again, the movement you know, has to be safe, you know, make it safe first. Any questions before I get into mechanics and kinematics and strokes? Because I know that when I came to the sessions, I used to be a hypocrite. I used to like sit there and be like, I only learned like two things. I only learned like two things. And then I said, well, you know, I stole a couple of things this year. Why don't I go do it? So um, again, hopefully this will help you. Again, get out of your comfort zone and do so. Again, if you don't feel comfortable with the feet, practice it every now and then. Because we tell our kids to work on stuff, there's no reason you all shouldn't as well. Same thing with like the hand feet. You can use the hand feet. You know, that's, it's very doable. So I'll kind of switch gears here. All right. And let's, let's start with serve. <coughs> A couple of these guys right here. Um, I'm going to stop this. Bruce Elliott. Um, he, he cited in a lot of ITF articles. There's stuff online of coach, coaching and uh, sports uh, science review every quarter that comes out. It's free on ITF.com, and he's presented a couple books. Um, Google Scholar is something that blew my mind. Okay, you could go down the rabbit hole on anything from medicine to fitness to health, longevity, sauna, heat shock proteins, you name it. But um, when you Google tennis biomechanics, Elliot, or Bahamande, or Mark Kovac, some of those guys, you're gonna see meta-analysis come up. Anyone know what a meta-analysis is? Does anyone not know? A meta-analysis is like 20 different articles on a particular subject, and then they take all the articles, they cite them, and then they talk about their commonalities, or common threads. Google Scholar, it's free, all right? Because I know you all have nothing better to do in the classroom, right? I'm busy too, I teach special ed. So, you know, again, it's, it's pretty hard. All right, these are the books, is ITF Technique Performance, um, and then there's also a, a Advanced Biomechanics, it's got Ferrero on the front, the back, and it's got the doll from when he was, I think, like 10, up till, I don't know, 2004, it looks like, by the thing. This is Brian Gordon, stop that. He, um, he worked with Rick Macy for a long time. Um, he went to Indiana University, same place that Bahamande did, and um, again, he kind of stole what Brody, Braden, Bahamande, and Elliot did. Um, but let's face it, how many of you all have had articles published in the New York Times about you? He has. <coughs> so it's some good stuff, 3D tennis technologies. I don't know where he is, you can see the Macy's, that's an old website, he and Macy split. Macy's still at Tokelago, and I don't know where Brian went, to be honest. Um, next one. Sorry, I don't five seconds. All right, this is more Elliot. This is stuff that's on Google Scholar. They even have their emails. Like, they're probably sick of hearing from me. All right, so um, 
it's kind of funny if the video was close. They, they studied um, the 2000 Sydney Olympics. So just so when you see some of this research here, um, <coughs> does anyone know who won that? 2000 Sydney? That was, that was Kafelnikov who beat Haas in the final. Federer lost the fourth place match to a Frenchman. Um, a little buzz in a big name, but I'm sure you all know him better than I do. But I mean, you're talking, you have Google, you, you can Google who's in the 2000 Olympics. So they didn't use the names in the study on who they used, but the Olympics used our ATP professionals. So know that I'm just not pulling this from your local teaching pro who played at number six at your local high school. All right, a couple things. You can't really see it. 70%, and now we're not talking about the legs, I want to quantify it. We're not talking about the legs. The legs get that hip up into the spot where the shoulder gets, but 70% of the power after that for maximum external rotation when that forearm is parallel to the ground by using the legs the right way, 40% of it is from internal rotation. Do you teach the kids internal rotation? No. Do you teach them to hip drive? Yes. Do you teach them how to do it? What are other ways to teach internal rotation? Pour the cup of water out. All right, that's a great way to teach kids to internally rotate. In the kinetic chain, that happens very late. Some of the studies, they think, um, the arm extension uh, doesn't really give you a lot because it's not really speeding up from contact. That's done, that year is over. Um, and also, wrist extension. You'll see that at the bottom, that's flexion, that's 30%. Well, I was told not to flex my wrist when I teach, all right? They're not telling you to flex it past neutral. You're going from a hyperextended to a pretty much three, four, five degrees past neutral. You don't have to teach that. But again, the, there is an action of the wrist. It's just hyperextension to neutral. There's no hyperflexion, if you will. There's no gooseneck like in basketball. One thing that's really left out, um, and, and I was kind of on the other side, I'm, I'm a tennis, a high school tennis coach now, was uh, internal horizontal flexion of the shoulder. What is that? Anyone know what that is? That's a big component that coaches mess up on. Because when you're hitting, you know, when we're hitting forehands, that's a huge part, all right? On the serve, all right, when I get the maximum external rotation, horizontally that shoulder's flexing. We're gonna come back to that, all right? How do you teach that? How do you strengthen the muscle that moves the bone, all right, to get the joint in the right spot? Anyone can do a fly, right? I can do a horizontal fly with a cable, all right? Somebody might have done it, you might have previous experience with that, or I can do an incline adduction, a deduction, all right? How do you teach that? How about a seatbelt? You know a driver's side seatbelt, how it slips over your, your shoulder and goes down to your hip? That's the line of the elbow. If your shoulder's rotating, this is the engine. That's what Brian would always talk about. This is the engine, all right? Because again, we're gonna look at the forehand here in a little bit, and um, if you're, you're playing a good player, but I'm playing David Daniel. He broke four tennis balls out here last year. Four, all right? He hits the ball hard. I don't have a chance to set my feet. We're going to tell you how to use the ground to get some ground reaction force. But again, I'm, I'm hitting here. I'm hitting on the run. If I don't know what to do with my upper body, I'm going to be in trouble if I'm playing David or if I'm playing someone that's running around. Now, I can be a great spoon-fed kid. Everybody's had those teaching pros to just be, oh, great, good shot. Extend out, good shot, there you go, there you go. Bad spin, brush, you know, they use those terms. All right, good players, look how good you're getting good. 500 hours, 10 lessons, I'll throw you the 11 for free. I was there, all right? That's not what this is about. Let's move over one. So again, that internal rotation. Now, anyone heard of Neil deGrasse Tyson? Right? Anyone have an expensive phone? There's a little phone trick, so if you learn one thing from me, you can learn something so you won't break your phones. If I want to be able to rotate this phone, if I pull it out of my pocket and it's upside down, all right, how do I flip it over without having to let it go? All right, I've got a center of gravity, and then once I put my hand under that center of gravity, I use the force to flip the phone, and now it's regular. I don't have to do any work. The force is translated, all right, so I get some displacement of that phone. So then I don't have to fumble it. That's when people break their phones, right? They drop them when they're trying to change it from up to down. All right? So, how does that apply to serve? How many of you teach toss? I hate that word. Put it up there. Get it up there. How many people teach their kids to move your center of gravity back towards the left along a negative x-axis? 
If I'm serving that way, positive X, negative X. When I put that toss up, I want to make sure that my center mass is moving which way? To the left. That way, when I produce ground reaction force, I can get my shoulders in a much better, faster position. Again, going back to the grip. People are serving here, that, that ball's right out in front of their head from this, from this view. I always teach my kids from where you all are to me, because the brain doesn't have to reverse the image. All right? So that's a huge thing. You know, it might not if you're just getting someone out there to put it in play. People can be very effective without being impressive. Right? Everybody's had that athlete. We had a girl that quit basketball six months. She was our number six player. Now, she developed some of her strokes, but she's just an athlete. But you're not going to get that all the time. Next one. How am I doing on the time? Oh, Lord. Okay. All right. This is Pete Sampras. This is Pete Sampras. Again, center mass, back behind the body. Vic Brady did a study with BJ Arbitrage, and he said, no, I, I know I'm back scratching. I know my rack is close to my back. No, it isn't. VJ Arbitrage, anyone remember? Indian Davis Cuffer, and they filmed him, all right? And he puts those loads on the internal rotators, that's back, the forearms level with the ground, the arms rotated, the upper arms rotated back at about 172 degrees, but you're not gonna get it without the leg force. People say, well, you can't hit or serve hard without leg force. You can a couple times, but you can't get the joint angles, you can probably rip your shoulder apart. One of those rotator cuff muscles. <clears throat> All right, Billy Jean King. That's, that's on the top of my bulletin board. Because not many of my kids look like that. There's lateral flexion, brackets up on edge, brackets to the side of the head. All right, arms above the head. When I took a, a video of uh, who was a kid from Moonisa's half brother who played ATP last year? Who was a kid? Uh, 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 Jason. Jason. I filmed him down at McFarland and I knew his, I knew his family. And all you saw was his chin from where you all are. The ball was above the head, the arm is above the head. 12 o'clock, you're teaching one o'clock? You might not be getting, you might be leaving some MPHs on the table. Next one. All right, so I use coach design. Uh, it's Marat Sapp. So you're seeing commonalities, women players, men players, European players, Russian players, South American players. And, and I use it because I can send it home to them. I think it was like three bucks. Three bucks, Coach Josiah, I think it's a little bit better. All right. All right, look familiar? You, you know why I really got into this this spring? My, my son's nine and he's playing baseball and like all day long he's, at, he's, he's doing this. All day long, that's him. I wanna make sure he doesn't get hurt. All right, playing baseball, all right, look at some of the angles. All right, you're still getting a leg push. Nolan Ryan, I know he's a, he's a legend, right? They said he had some of the strongest legs, but instead of pushing this way, he's pushing this way, but everything else is pretty similar. The external rotation, all right? The abduction, how far that shoulder is away from the body. Anybody care to guess what's optimal, maybe? Anyone care to guess? About 100 degrees. 100 degrees plus or minus. And again, this is going back to that 2000 Olympic study, all right? All right, horizontal flexion. How many people teach their kids to somersault into the court? At impact, most of those players from that Olympic study were about 28 degrees of horizontal flexion. All right, over that transverse axis, this way. So there's three different axes that are going on. So again, there's a lot out there, but you gotta address it one thing at a time. My biggest thing that I get with a lot of players is they drive the hip and they, they leak this too soon. That's a big thing, they start leaking this instead of using their shoulders and keeping their hands a little more passive. But a lot of kids, they, they're this way, where they drive the hip and they stay in one spot. You'll, you'll see a lot of that when you start filming hundreds of kids. At Joey Cantu's camp, I filmed, what, about 65 kids? Yeah. And sent them home with them, just to kind of give them something once they, they can watch. But again, I prefer coaches. I, all right, again, there's that horizontal flexion. I think that's roundage. That's roundage. So you're, you're seeing some commonalities. Again, world-class players, and, and that's Guillermo Coria. Remember him? He blew the... French Open final, up two sets to love. Who was that that beat him? I forget. Anyway, it was, it was about 91, 92. Guillermo Correa, real pretty motion on the serving. He was a little guy, but he moved his joint angles really well. And, and this is in the ITF book from Elliot. <laughs> Alright, again, the book has some charts in case you want to get a little bit more deeper down that rabbit hole. Alright, now. 
and a cornucopia. All right. Nobody smiled. Nobody likes to hear over here? Nobody. So forehand, any questions like on the serve before I speedily move along the forehand? So again, am I right maybe? All right, but you know, that's, that's what we're here for. I think kind of to open that conversation. So um, without further ado, we'll go on. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, the timing of different body parts affects how high or low the toss is. Um, usually it's, for, it's about nine feet for someone that's, I think, five foot ten, five foot eleven. The girls are a little smaller, so I would assume, you know, obviously through research that it has to be down there. What, what I would do is, is, is I tell them to go home and use a mirror. We're thinking about getting a, you know, a mirror out here. You can obviously mark on the fence. But again, there's a couple different ways to toss. You know, like instead of, instead of, Often such a poor choice of words. Some people, and what I used to hear growing up in Florida is you, know, you flex the wrist or extend the wrist maximally, and then when you get up to about eye level, you get a nice flat platform. You know, that's one way. Um, the second way is, you know, I, I rest the, the, the ball on my ring finger. I don't let it touch the pinky. So that way as I'm, you know, I'm setting up, remember the hip should be rotated a little further than the shoulders when I start. You know, typically that's, again, that's another commonality. All right, so with the toss, you know, making sure that it's on that, on that ring finger, and I'm, I'm kind of putting it up so I can read the writing on that ball. You don't see a lot of you know, rotation forward when you put that toss up. I don't know if that helps. Sometimes I'll you know, stick a ball in the fence. You know, I'll kind of. I mean, what I usually do, but it's been always mm -hmm. is a uh, little trick I learned from the old coach in the mm -hmm. 80s. It was uh, you have them toss it up on the fence. If you're talking about in the trap, you grab it. Stop it, yes. That's a great tip. I don't know if you heard, you know, putting it up onto the fence and, and trapping it. And you know what that really teaches? That, that's a great, um, that, that's an objective truth tip. That's going to repeat itself over and over again. That's not for personal truth. You're, you're, you're going to get a lot of that, that horizontal flexion of the waist if you trap it. So you might get a little bit more heat on the ball. That, that's a great tip to trap it. Um, any more questions? On, and we can talk. I'll be around all weekend in case you want to geek out, you know. Talk with you about it and see what you think. I have a question. Action reaction videos. Teach any action reaction in that motion? Well, you know. The action reaction is. Like in terms of the prep? In terms of the prep, well, you know, there's there's three common take backs. You know, there's you know, Gail Monfils and, and Roddy, they kind of come up together. There's one up and back that's more of a feather, and then there's also the up and down. You know, what what happens before you get to that lowest racket extended position? That's a little bit more like style per se. And then the commonalities kind of start from there. There's not a lot of variance after that. There's, there's not a lot of variance. So the question was, you know, starting it up with the prep, you know, how do I, you know, how do I differentiate? Because, you know, sometimes you make the mistake of trying to fix too much, where sometimes they bring it together. Sometimes, you know, on the serve, they, they don't get any ground reaction for us. They're, they're doing the old volleyball and they're extended when that toss is up. But then for some reason, they, they can kind of get, get in that position. You know, they can kind of get there. So, again, that, that goes back to what I talked about earlier, optimize or adapt. Now, if they're having problems, you know, holding their serve, then, you know, you might want to have that conversation in late October. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I have a lot that get in the habit, especially even girls. Mm -hmm. um, they get in the habit of put the racket back there and then toss it. Mm -hmm. I, I like I a, a version of There's a girl that won the state title with a Jay Berger, if you will. I might remember Jay Berger. I'm dating myself. You know, I prefer, like, if you get a kid that has it started. Last year I did something on how to throw the racket outside, like bad weather days. I kind of alternate fitness and tennis, you know, on court. Yeah, you know, if they started up here in a salute, I like that a little bit better. I don't really like that full back stretch because they never really <coughs> learn to stretch out. You know what I mean? They never learn, like if, if, if they're back here, typically I'm, I'm, I'm closed off on the hip, my hands are out in front, and, and then that's kind of hard. So if I put them here, guess what I can do? I can go behind them and kind of push right here and I can kind of open them up a little bit. That, that's, that's what worked in the past. I wouldn't go down to my full extended or lowest racket position. All right. So, and like, we'll, we'll move forward. I, it's, it won't take a lot of time for questions at the end. I still have my crayon. Go ahead. <laughs> for, for in case Randy comes back. Great guy, this kid, Andrew. So, this, this brings me back to how much time do you have to set your feet? 
you know, in, in a lot of the meta-analysis, they talk about the benefits of neutral, closed, open. But a lot of times, you know, from the standpoint of how what you're doing with your feet, um, you know, you're, you're going to have to be kind of a figure skater out there and learn how to push up against that ice. And, and, and what I can tell you is that, you know, the, the hip extension piece is probably invaluable. That's something that you really want to teach how to pop that hip. Because the faster that I extend from the hip, the more that this is going to, more trunk rotation is conducive to less injury. Um, you know, return of serve position, you know, you, you might not be able to do that as much, like if you're kind of like hit and land, or if you're returning hit and land instead of load, extend, you know, to load and unload. Um, so, so from a standpoint of, of, of forehands, you know, that's, there's a lot of confounding evidence, all right, with, with what is, what's best. And, but I will go through some of the commonalities that are my non-negotiables, what I think. All right, again, tennisplayer.net, um, Brian Gordon operates that uh, or, or contributes. It's John Yandel. Anybody use tennisplayer.net? They have once a month. USPTA used to give it to people for free. But um, tennisplayer.net is a good, good service because it kind of explains things a little bit better than I do, I'm sure. All right, hands on the right side. Yes, not your head, yes. You have to be able to do that, especially when you start getting into a, a higher level ball. We want to be here. We don't want to be inside. We don't want to be inside. That's a big problem I have. Sometimes when the elbow's tucked in and people are hitting forehands, you'll see them get ready. You'll see them kind of load up, the unit turn, and then you'll see this. And you want to kind of down here. Somewhere down in this neighborhood. That's where it gets a little bit dicey, depending on who you talk to. Because then the racket can't flip. All right. Anybody never not ever heard of the flip on the forehand or the lag? The flip. What tends to happen is from this position here, as long as I keep that angle, all right, we think if I make sure that I load from the ground up and I'm ground reaction force, and once I flip that hit, that racket's gonna flip back. It's actually gonna be in a different plane. All right. It's, it's not out here, it's back there. And, and that's what the flip is. It, it gives you a little bit more of an elastic response to your forehand. All right, and that's what he's getting ready to do. So again, um, we get into contact, a couple things. Transition point from linear to angular, linear. Just like I'm going to the back of the room, the racket's traveling, pretty much linear. Anybody ever seen the killer forehand from Pat Doherty or Nick Boletari? And they put their hands like this and the people come over here. You know, that's a kind of a good trick to do. You kind of put your hand back into that leg. I'll do it if you keep your, keep your wrist loose. And pull the racket out of your hand without touching my hand. Pull the racket without touching my hand. Pull the swing it. Pull the swing it. Swing it. Right. They, they talk about that. That's the linear portion of your forehand. That's the linear portion. When does it become angular? When the racket gets to be about perpendicular with the court. All right. That's what they found. So when he gets to about here, and I'll do it with you. When he pulls that racket through the slot, and he gets about right here. Notice where his elbow is. This is huge. This is huge. I can't stress that enough with kids hitting forehands. Having that space out here to be able to go out towards your target. Again, having that horizontal translation. All right? If I'm not pulling, if I'm getting yippy, for lack of a better word, if I get yippy with that wrist and I start extending and flexing from here, I'm going to lose control. I might not lose too much power, but I'm going to be the best looking player in consolation. All right? So when I pull here, then that's when, again, shoulder, adduction, as well as extension. If you're going to read the analyses and you get on there and you kind of hunt around like I do, you'll see that extension is important, joint extension, to keep it in a lax beforehand. But really, what you don't see, go ahead, a couple slides there. My no? All right. What you'll see is commonalities. I forgot if that was Guga or who that was or Sonda. I'm not sure. But again, you're seeing that you're seeing that same commonality. I think that's something that you have to not bargain with. Preps, you know, you could have Stalin and Djokovic, you know, you, you could have a, a multitude of preps. You could have like Agassi, a semi-loop. Agassi hit a semi-loop. Down and up. Alright? You can see that straight back, that, that McEnroe kind of unit turn. You could have a smaller loop. You could have a little bigger loop. You could have the racket tilted a little bit forward. Alright, Fernando Gonzalez from Chile, remember him? That guy could hit the snot out of the ball. And then the racket tip was almost facing where Coach Daniel is right over there. All right? So, so those are things that are like style. That, that's something that, that has to be insisted upon. 
I talk about picking battles with my kids, you know, so they don't put the racket down. That's one of them. Um, now, if you look up at the top, I wish you could see a little bit better, but look at the end of the white line up at the top. Don't worry about wrist angle rotates. The point that I'm making on this slide is look how that shoulder moves from right to left. That might be a function of long axis and longitudinal rotation, but really it's also a, a using that engine of the shoulder pretty well. That's how to bring your, your player score hands to another level. And again, how do, you, how do you work on that? How do you work on someone that hasn't felt they had that mind-muscle connection? You hook up a band, you go in your trainer's room, you cut off a length of two, and then you tie it around the fence, and, and, you, and you kind of practice that, that, that pulling, all right? Again, getting to that point quicker. So going back to that same slide, serve is on one um, side, forehand is on another. Forehand, I think it was like 15, or horizontal flexion, that's adduction. To the forehand, it's responsible for 25% of um, racket velocity at impact. 25%, and, and believe me, I've, I've looked at how many studies coach, that's, that's probably plus or minus about, you know, 5 percentage points standard deviation, you know, that's, that's about where I'm seeing it on many of those studies. <coughs> All right, a couple of on-court drills. Anyone know who painted that? You missed the Banksy picture. Everybody know who Banksy is? The artist that had his work shredded. You see that? That was yeah, Banksy. He's like the he's like the badass like artist now. Nobody knows who he is. This is um, Peter Max. He did the NBC Peacock. He was commissioned by the U.S. Open to do that. So um, on-court drills in games. I call it KFC, like Kentucky Fried Chicken. Just make it a cute little name, KFC. And, and I do it workup style. Like if Deuce, David, and I were all playing on the court, David would most definitely win the most points, so he would move up. I would most definitely lose the most points, so I would move down, and then Deuce would stay. And then Deuce would stay, okay? So then we do that for a little bit of while, and I'll start peeling kids off, right? I'll start peeling kids off, and I'll film them, and especially in the off season. They like that. Um, rank chaser rallies. Does anyone have rank chasers, like AP kids? Everybody should be raising their hand. So what I'll do is, let's do some these like spotted and just real soft to each other. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll be volleying here on this side, I'll say 90. Oh, that's about 75. That's about 75, that's 90. Oh, that's a 35, you got your credit uh, protection there. You have to retake the class, oh, that's low. So can you give them a, you know, just to, just to make it kind of fun. You know, because I've got a lot of smart kids, but then they volley up here, they wonder why they can't hold serve, or they wonder why no one wants to play with them. All right. Um, I wish we could get outside for this, um, the slide family. So, let's say I have my net. So I've got my net here. And let's say this is the net post. And I call it family because you can pretty much do any drill from this formation. You can do two back, two up, one back, two up, one up, one back on both sides. And the person over here is watching. If Deuce makes the mistake, what do I do? I slide in there. He has to go hit on the ball for 30 seconds, or pick up 10 balls, or whatever, go give me a drink, or give me coffee or something. So the slide family works, and I, and I wish I could demonstrate it, because I know like a lot of you want games, all right? Or offense, defense. Offense, defense, anyone know how to play that? So if I lose the point, I got to backpedal, and I'm in transition. If I'm in the point, I'm, I'm coming in, I'm coming in here. So same rules apply. That slide family rule is, is if I make a mistake, I slide out, person slides in now. This is the big safety concern. If David, you stand next to me real quick, you don't need to have the ball to slide. Just right here, right here. So like if he and I are playing a point, all right, and I lose, do slides over for me, the person at the net post slides in. Well, let's say the opposite happens. Let's say if Deuce makes a mistake, the person just comes in, so you're always rotating in one direction. Because you don't want someone crossing over and getting hit with a rack or eating the ball. No fun plus sandwiches, that's a big brain line. And then Gopher is kind of fun, it's like my little cheesy game. Um, Gopher's like we're, like we're in a single file line, and you hit, get, so like you can hit, and then if I make a mistake, I have to sit, and then to get out of sitting, I have to, I have to hit off my glutes, and then I get to go up, and then I'm back in line. So those are just kind of like little fun games to, to have the better kids show off, let's face it. You know, why is it fun being good unless you can show off for your peers? You know, the kid that's developed a big forehand, or the kid that was number 12 last year that's now he's in your, your starting lineup. Those kinds of games, even though it is jump volume, um, I think there's a need for that, and I hope you do too.
because again, it's you're not always getting the, the Spartan-like tennis player. Usually, those kids are playing football and, and, uh, and volleyball and maybe baseball. So go ahead and start that up. We can just let these run go. I was lucky enough to spend some time with Vic Braden, and that's Debbie Danko and Moresmo. You see how big Moresmo is? She's strong. And that was in Miami. And I worked. Uh, Barry Mills gave me tickets. His dad, Alan Mills, was the one that used to go out there for the McEnroe um, explosions and times. So he gave me tickets there. It's kind of fun. Snoopy, I'm a big fan. Snoopy, big fan of his technique. Samuel Jackson almost beat me up. I'll tell you that later. I'll tell you about that story later. I was running down the river, river walk. He snuck down. And then this is uh, one of our coaches. That's Brady Lyre right there. He actually was on NBC with Monty Ginobili. He's a big fan. He didn't show up today. It pissed me off. He didn't show up today. I didn't want to do that. And then, of course, there's nothing in like it. We got a couple of little sayings here. Commitment is pushing yourself when no one else is around, and that holds true. Um, I put up a shed, and to my chagrin, I lose a lot of tennis balls, but I give kids the code. So they can go up to the courts, and even if they have to ride a bike or a skateboard, they can, they can go ahead and, and use our facilities. Um, lucky enough to hang with Jimmy Connor for like five minutes. I was friends with um, the Brandon Davis Cup um, coach for a while, and he got me backstage. Uh, and then this is kind of your adaptation versus your optimization. You gotta go do some bad days to earn the best days of your life. And for my life, that's definitely held true this year. Um, holding on to anger, I don't know what that is, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> All right. And then Agassi, oh man, that's the holy grail right there. Did you know me? You've probably seen that on my refrigerator and on my post. And then Bobby, that's Bobby Kleineke right there. I stole the trophy from him. I stole the seat, look, he's trying to grab me. He has the best trophies. Bobby Kleineke, man, he's great for tennis and what we do as high school coaches, even though he was a college coach for how many years? And that's what he did to me, he put the racket over my head. He thought I was. Um, Michael Jordan, big fan. I guess nowadays with Insta Space and all those social media apps, I'm trying to know too much about Michael Jordan, but I still hold him in high regard for his greatness. And then Coach K, going back to the kind of kids, soft players, practice sucks players. You know, you do have to have an element of, of entertainment value, and you have to, um, I think, um, show your value to the kids if they feel like they don't get anything from you. They're probably not going to play for you or work very hard in practice. So thank you very much. I treasure the time that I spend with you. Nobody calls it don't part. It's important. And then thank you to my my wonderful lady friend fiance for filming and helping me. So um, thank you very much. Unless you have any questions, thank you so much for sitting in and putting up with me for an hour.